that's a great example. That's a great example of why it's so important to tailor it to each region. There's a whole suite of tools. And I think Ted probably has Ted, do you want to kind of foreshadow? Oh, I could talk about this for a long time. But one minute, Ted. One minute. One minute. But, uh, but you raise a very good question, but we did do this in Southeast Kelowna as well. And if you go back uh, in the drought of 2003, Kelowna had a lot of problems in the early 1990s. And they were going to increase the reservoir and water, you know, water management branch. We were not doing it there. Do so they went ahead with an evening program. And you notice in 2003, Kelowna did not have, Southeast Kelowna did not have a problem with and it was because the meters allowed them to have a very good management tool. And you have to look at it this way. You will secure your water for your farm by having a meter, because the district should be, if they do follow the Kelowna example, establish a rate that farmers can use to irrigate their crops without any risk. And Kelowna did that. They said, okay, 28 inches is what we came up with, that you as all the farmers in the district would have enough water to do what you want to do on your property. So you're going to get allocated 28 inches, no additional cost. And you're secured that water. But if you go over 28 inches, you're going to be paying a premium. There are farmers that paid $1,500 extra for water last year or the year before because they went over the allocation of 28 inches. Farmers that stayed under that allocation didn't have to pay any more. So it's, if you look at it a different way, it's a way of securing your water for your farm. Now, I guess you could argue that if I'm using a drip system and I'm using less, I should get money back. And that opportunity, I think, is also there down the road as water becomes scarcer and we have less supply, that maybe we can provide premiums back to people that are saving water. So don't look at the meter as a penalty. The meter is just a very good management tool. And if anything, it should keep you, you know, secure your water for your farm. That's the way I look at it. Thank you. Ms. Minnesota, and I think you have a, a question here. Well, I better get the Minnesota side. I'm Small communities are here today would place themselves in that position. Bob Weir, you know, with Qualicum Beach. I mean, what's what's the situation with Qualicum Beach in terms of where you sort of see yourself on the on the continuum and, and why you're here today? I think our experience is probably quite a bit different than the Okanagan one, in that uh, we're we're probably blessed with a fairly good water resource, and um, I don't think we see our, see growth um, outpacing our supply. Right. But at the same time, in our history, we. We at one point had twice the average consumption, uh, or the, the BC average of consumption. And we've gotten ourselves down where we're almost in line with, with what the average should be. 
Um, this is good because I think it's helping to start to energize the crowd now that the effects of last night I think are wearing off for those who went to bed late. And uh, I just want to thank Oliver and give him the beloved party gift. I'll take window number three. Yeah. 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 Even, even, even though we're a faculty, you know, this, we're, this is a team effort, you know, you still have to show some recognition. So, Oliver, Thank you. Uh, another great presentation. And uh, <laughs> I just want to make one last note. I think that those two, Kim's done a great job of trying to engage the audience a bit. But those two examples, those are two great examples of what we're talking about. That's the vision. The vision. In this case, Balkan Beach, it's not so much an ecological constraint as our goal is to be more online an average per capita water use. How do we get there? That's, that's a clear, good example of a process. But Lady Smith, different issue. We actually have physical limits and we have growth. What do we do? How do we get there? Again, a very different sort of preferred future, but with, with similar tools of process to get there. So thanks, Kim, for drawing that out. Thank you very much. Next, I want to introduce an old colleague of mine because God, we started out as junior engineers 30 years ago, didn't we, Ron? <laughs> and so when we, when we were designing this program in terms of, of again, providing these, these building blocks of knowledge, and because we both have this 30-year history in terms of, we know how we engineers do things, <laughs> and sort of, can I use the word pseudoscience? I mean, that's really what it comes down to sometimes, right? Because we can you know, present you with these graphs, and they look very scientific, but you know, if you look behind them, kind of suspect. And that essentially is what Ron is going to deal with because we want we want to we want to deal with this issue of you know, the water out, you put water in, the variables, and all of uncertainty about the science. So the, the significant thing here in terms of Ron's background, in addition to being a long-term engineer, he's been with the province for the last 22 years, and in his role, he's the he's been the allocation guy. Right? Ron had to make those decisions in terms of how to how to share out the water resources, and that's especially relevant to the Okanagan. So. We're going to be drawing Ron's experience as a water allocator and a water planner to deal with some of the issues of, it starts with an understanding of the variables. Ron? I'm going to do a, a voice check here. Can those people at the back hear me? Okay. It's okay? If I, uh, if I trail off or something, would you wave like that and, and I'll speak up again? Um, I'm not sure whether I've actually been... Uh, <laughs> feel better about what I said because you referred to me as old and I heard uh, Oliver talk about uh, 21st century uh, water managers so hopefully I'm still considered a 21st century water <laughs> but I think you know there are, there are some really relevant points that have already been made and that uh, what I liked what Oliver said was looking in the rear view mirror because in fact that's what we've been doing and I'm hoping by the end of my presentation you'll understand, and I think it's what Eric was talking about, we really need to be looking for those windows, because otherwise we are, and in some parts of the problems you've already run into the wall. So that's what this is aimed at. You've all heard about science-based decisions. Now, I think the reason that I have a lot of difficulty with accepting that, there's an inference because it's science-based, it's based on fact therefore it's valid. So one has to be very careful about what does a science-based decision mean. And if any of you have ever been involved in preparing either for an appeal hearing or a court case, you can find two very competent scientists taking the same data set and coming up with totally different conclusions. So that's what this is about. And you've got to remember, I've earned my living by being an engineer. So if I sound that I'm somewhat down on my profession or whatever, we, we approach it with professional integrity, but also I'm trying to provide a little bit of insight. You have to be really careful about what does this result mean. So this is just an overview of my presentation. I've already touched on confidence in the science, and I'm going to talk about the science on the supply and on the demand side. As Kim pointed out, it's a very simple equation, supply, demand, in, out, whichever you want to call it, but they're variable on both sides, and that's a really critical point to understand. It's not just supply science that's variable, and we may have some real questions about, but the demand side, and I think Oliver was kind of getting there as far as what is the service of the water, how is it used?
what's, what's the acceptable, acceptable level of risk to the different users. And I want to start off with having people understand leaving water in a stream is a use. There are, there, there are sometimes people will talk about that use as non-consumptive, and I caution people about that term because it can be very misleading. If you must leave water in a stream, then for any other user, it's far more consumptive than a consumptive use. And that makes sense because, in fact, that is where those aquatic creatures live. So, but if you think about it as a use, that helps understanding when we're talking about the competition for water, then in fact it's valid. <coughs> and they, if you really want it, they have more right to the water than we do because without it, they'll die sooner than we will. We will also die, but they'll disappear a lot faster, take a fish out of the sea, and see how long it survives. So then, if we're dealing with a complex science, we need to have some tools to share the knowledge. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give an example, a little tool that was developed to help share some of this knowledge. And, uh, and give you a little, just I wanna touch a little bit about uh, on planning. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on planning, but I do wanna touch on it. So a little bit more focus of what I'm gonna focus on in, in the presentation today is, uh, I'm going to provide some insight into the confidence uh, on the supply and demand side, what level of risks are acceptable, and uh, we'll take a little bit of a look at that tool. And I'm going to only focus on three major drivers with, with particular emphasis on the in-stream, on the in-stream folks. And when we're talking in-stream, if we talk about fish, we're already too high up the food chain. We really have to start looking at uh, the benthic organisms when we're talking about the health of the stream. So, the supply science. In British Columbia, unfortunately, we do not have a lot of hydrometric data. And in recent years, been, there's been a real cutback on the number of stations that are maintained. And even though we're looking in the rearview mirror, if we don't keep track of what's happening out there, how can we possibly do trend analysis? How will we know the issue you raised about five years, you want to know whether climate's changing, whether it's producing anything, we don't have the data, how are we gonna know? So there is value. In fact, it's probably more significant now than it's ever been that we actually have to collect hydrometric data. So you then use different statistical methods, different distributions to find out how does this data fit? What's the best fit? We also believe or not relied on an allocation decision making on spot measurements. That's really getting dicey when you do that, but sometimes if there's not too much risk to the user, that's what we relied on. And although no, local knowledge can really be uh, uh, iffy, um, I'd like to share a personal experience with you about local knowledge. And that, that is that, um, in one example I'm gonna give you, the DFO person and myself were walking in a stream in the summertime in August. And that's where you find out, here's a little bit of water coming in. It's coming in from groundwater. We measured the temperature it was significantly lower than the main body of the stream. So in other words, when we're looking at where should we, where can we safely take water out of a stream, we really have to understand the dynamics of the stream. And the only way you're gonna do that is to virtually, what we were doing, walk in that stream. That's where that local knowledge comes in. And that's where I think if we can get people more involved in their watersheds, they live there, we equip them, then we can start to get some real data that will actually help us get away from these broad bands that you'll see me talking about later. So to help us in the allocation section, the engineering section for the Ministry of Environment produced a guideline and uh, they looked at uh, 124 natural uh, flow survey of Canada water stations and this is the area that they drew the data from <coughs> fairly significant area of British Columbia. And uh, within that area, there are 29 relatively long-term stations that they use in the analysis. And this is an example of Dishon Creek. <coughs> Dishon Creek is it's actually in the headwaters. Uh, it's a tributary to the Nicola River Basin. Nicola River was one of the, I think it was on the top of the list.
this last year of endangered rivers in British Columbia. And what I want to draw your attention to, uh, talk about data, you can see the extreme variability from one year to the next. The, the top graph is actually a plot of freshet volumes. And when you're uh, looking at what's available for storage, that's the graph you're interested in there. You can see here, this is the mean, that line right across there. And here we have a seven year period that the freshet volume, in other words, the bank account that we're going to look at to get us through the dry summer is way below normal, very significant. The bottom plot is your seven day low flow in the summertime. This is where you start to understand where you get into the conflict with the offstream and the in-stream value system. And again, in four years, late 1980s, we had extreme low flows. You can see the combination there. If you take what came out of fresh <coughs> your bank account and what's actually happening, you got severe issues. And, th and this is not, those of you that are kind of a little bit hesitant about climate change, whether we call it climate change or not, these are real flows. These are real records. This is what's happening. It doesn't really matter much why it's happening. There are not extractions above this point. This is natural variation. So in the uh, guidelines they produced, they identified five different physiographic zones ranging from the high mountains to the interior plateau. And each one of those physiographic zones ended up with unit freshet volume, cubic decimeters per square kilometer, it doesn't matter what these units are. And this simply shows that the larger the drainage area, the lower the actual unit runoff you're going to get. That's your unit freshet volume. That's just an example. Actually, some of the other uh, physiographic zones, this line is much flatter. There's not really much change in, uh, in the size versus your unit output. And I'm only giving these as an example of the tools that were supplied to us in our allocation decision making. This is the, the very critical seven day low flow. This is what determines when we actually decide to cut off licensing. The rules we were using at the time is we wanted to make sure that an irrigator basically had an 80% probability of getting their water. And guess what? We really didn't care what fish got, whatever was left over. And that was the reality. And that's how we ended up with um, essentially about the mid-70s where we had oversubscribed streams. So we have this guideline that's produced, great tool. But I want to emphasize, this is in the introductory paragraph to the guideline. So it's a regional drought analysis enhanced by simple correlations and comparisons with other, I like this, scanty records. So that's that. And then this is in the, uh, the, towards the end of the document, it says this relies on the judgment and experience of the user to consider the differences in watershed characteristics. So unless you actually have some, again, knowledge of this particular watershed, here's this document that's produced by science, it's not of much value. So just, you know, it's like those cautionary labels, use it at your own risk. And one thing to just keep in mind, all of our decisions when you make, and it's still along British Columbia, all those decisions are appealable. And I took a fair amount of pride, and we did not have many of our decisions but when they were, uh, generally because of the kind of work we had done, uh, the, the legal people have to accept, well, that's, that's the understanding, that's the insight, then we have a good case and generally they set up. Okay, let's just project forward. This is taken out of the Trepani Landscape Unit Water Management Plan, just finished last June. Uh, some of this you've already seen, we're expecting earlier onset of spring fresh, higher rain to snow melt. But then what I find absolutely shocking, and actually I had to read this again, I've read it several times. If this is, if these are anywhere near accurate, <coughs> this is reductions, reductions in the total annual volume. So that's that area under the hydrograph. This early as 2020, there might be 20% less water available. I don't know about you, but I find that absolutely shocking. And in fact, we still have time, but unless we actually get serious about what we're using water for, 
Uh, Eric, we're going to be hitting the wall. So we better be looking for windows. And again, I think this is where, for me, what this really means is we need the data so, in fact, we can actually start to track what are the trends? What's happening out there? What, what is the trend like? How much time do we actually have? I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about waiting five years. And I, and I don't know what that was because I know in setting a plan, you, have, you can't. Our challenge is, can I go and make it? Could, could the present decision maker make a decision on that and say, well, I'm refusing this license because I know in 2020 the water's not going to be there? We don't have the science that can back it up. These models are, are they cover huge areas and are trying to bring them down to very small areas of the problem. So you would not be able to defend a decision like that. But possibly with trend analysis, we can get that 21st uh, century water manager making decisions, <coughs> looking backwards, but also here's the trend. So let's take a quick look at uh, the risk to the users. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on the domestic. Uh, there's, there's a fair amount of uh, material out there on population projections, unit demands, that type of thing. I'm going to spend a bit of time on agriculture, and again, I really want to take a closer look at uh, in-stream. When you're talking in you know, in-stream, you can talk about survival, or in fact, you can talk about optimal. There's a huge difference if you're talking about optimal conditions for fish versus uh, survival conditions. And, and one thing about fish, we have to understand, like any other living creature, nature sometimes is really tough on them. And a lot of the interior streams here, if it weren't for upstream storage, I'm not sure what kind of fisheries it would actually be. So if we look at, take a quick look at Waterworks purpose, these are on. Uh, th these are actually out of a uh, the 1996 uh, document on uh, the risk that, uh, from the province. So the smaller the lot size, the fewer the people you're serving. Actually, they could do without water for a longer period of time than what you got into. I guess that's the volume of the outcry. I'm not quite sure what's really. Um, and of course, the frequency of which that can occur. This is one every five years, this is one every 25 years. So this is a pretty rare event. And of course, when you get into your large municipal settings, this is totally unacceptable that you would have anything like that. But I, I, I use that just to uh, illustrate that it, there is an acceptable, acceptable level of risk. And this is where you, if you have a drought management plan, you get into, okay, you can't water your lawn, you can't wash your car, that type of thing. So in fact, you're still going to have some water for your basic human need. Um, I also want to just use this as an opportunity to illustrate a little bit of how thinking changes. At one time, cattle watering, which is fairly significant in parts of the interior here, uh, was considered so minor that it was an incidental purpose on your irrigation license. Um, there was a change in the mid-1990s where, in fact, because we're not talking about one or two cows, these are, these are major operations. So it was finally changed to an industrial purpose, and when we then started issuing licenses for industrial purpose, we also required the watering of the stock water outside the wetted perimeter of the stream in recognition of potential impact on water quality. If I move to uh, irrigation purpose now, Ted was involved in a lot of the work that, uh, that found its way into our policy and procedure manual on this, and I've just given some examples here just to give you an idea, again, of acceptable level of risk. Now, tree food in the soil, so in the sandy loam soil, basically pretty sensitive, can only do with the shortage for about four days, and you don't want that happening very often, about once every 10 years. Versus corn up in the San Juan Arm, uh, on a loam soil, basically you can suffer shortage for 20 years, and that, or 20 days, I'm sorry, and happen uh, once every five years. So depending on your soil type, your crop type and location, you can have either a, some resiliency or you don't actually have a lot of resiliency. And of course, when we're talking vineyards, uh, here, we, we, we really have to make sure that, uh, that they have a pretty assured water supply or in fact there's significant consequences. I'm going to show you a map after this. This is uh, 
the pumice was divided into different zones uh, based on evapotranspiration rates. And uh, the higher the evapotranspiration rate, of course, the more significant problem you may have. So here with the crop type here, this is a factor by which, uh, I guess it's uh, how resilient is the crop in, in the area that it's in. So the higher this number is, the more, the more uh, it could suffer, if you will. So this, this one here has got more resiliency than this one here. That's also reflected in the return period. And this basically is a map here. And I think the significance of this map may be hard to see at the back, but this zone here that we are in right now is zone five, the and, and again, when we talk about, this is historical, but we're looking at a evaporation losses of 0 0.20 to 0.32 inches per day. Whereas in northern British Columbia, it's less than 0.3 inches per day. And for me, if climate change is real, if it is happening, we would expect the area where we have less resiliency to increase. And, and one thing I found, in, you know, we used to have meetings of allocation section head. One thing I found, the folks that dealt with the water up here had a totally different perspective of water than somebody like myself who was having to manage it here. And also the island, we ran into the same thing, where it was almost like we, had, we were coming from different worlds. So one has to be very careful, I guess, if I were making a presentation up to somebody up in Smithers, it would probably be, have to be a little bit different, otherwise I wouldn't be speaking to them. But again, the point being, if in fact changes are occurring, we're going to lose some resiliency. So I said I was going to talk about uh, in-stream considerations. And there's actually, in-stream considerations has evolved in this province. This is the in-stream use policy. And it was restated in 1996. It was originally stated in 1986. I want to draw your attention here. In situations where water allocation decision will significantly, so will significantly impact the mainstream uses of water, the statutory decision maker may, not must, may refuse the application or include a condition on the license to protect the stream. And if there were an appeal in a situation like this, it was up to the person who actually said, the in-stream value is threatened to actually defend. So, so we would turn to that person and say, okay, now you take over. The Fish Protection Act made provisions for sensitive stream designations. And the Fish Protection Act was passed in the late 1990s. It was coming into effect through uh, regulation. There are no sensitive streams in the interior of British Columbia. There are sensitive streams. Those of you who are from the island are aware of them. And this is what this, this is statute in British Columbia, of course. So it will contribute to the protection now. So I'm, I'm trying to reflect here a change in attitude about fish. Who sustainability is at risk because of inadequate flow of water. Um, in the fall of 2000, there was actually a traveling roadshow. I think we visited about six communities, and, and we discussed these are candidates for sensitive stream designation. We we worked this out with the fisheries folks, and uh, some of these meetings I can tell you were pretty heated. And some of the exchange we just got a little bit of a taste of. Somebody who's got existing water rights, and they see those rights being threatened. One has to be extremely careful about how you broach that subject, what it is you share, because in fact, when you're dealing with fisheries, one of the challenges, the economy, who's who's actually getting benefits of the economy? Usually it's somebody, they've got a fish boat, they're on the coast, how does that money get back into where those fish are breeding? And so uh, I, I put this up here just that <coughs> it's out there. there. I can tell you there's been no uh, move to declaring any of these, and we might say, well, what would be the, what would be the significance if we did? Well, actually, the, there is quite a bit of significance. Um, there, is, there is assurance to anybody who has an application outstanding. Uh, 
uh, that in fact you would the standard that you have for meeting your application would be what it exists today. Once it's declared sensitive, there's a very high standard. The onus the onus actually switches to the applicant basically. It's a reverse onus on how why should the allocator let you take part of the stream? Have you examined other sources? Is it going to be necessary to have mitigation? <coughs> I'm watching my time here. Five see. minutes. Okay, and part of the challenge is, I'm going to have to move a little quicker. Part of the challenge is on, when we talk about fish, this is a, basically a fish chart. Different fish species, different life stages. And the only, where you can kind of relax is any of these blank boxes here. So there's not many of them. So, if, I mean, again, I'm, I'm trying to, for this use, if, if you thought the other ones are difficult, look at this chart. And then you can begin to understand, not only do I have to worry about incubation during these months here, if I have to worry about incubation, well, how much water do they need? Is the temperature critical? So I want to just share with you an attempt where we actually tried to, this is the one I was referring to where I was walking in the stream with the uh, DFO fellow. It's the Mew Creek watershed. It's in the North Thompson, a little bit of a blow up there. And we were going to take a approach here. Let's, let's put the 80% probability to both parties, the offstream and the in-stream. And that was the approach we took here. So essentially, <coughs> go through these very quickly. Detail is not really that important. I just want to show you a lot of work went into this. These were log normal plots of the data, the flow data for, for a day, one day. And that's how we then took that 80% probability number there. That was the basis on which we started to do the work. So once you have a number and you can say, well, here's what the flow is on August the 8th. It's 0.573. And the fish folks, if we use a 20% mean annual discharge, they're looking for 0.62. But the problem is, we've got 95% upper and lower confidence limits. So in other words, we're not exactly sure about that. It might be as much as 0.88 or as little as 0.30. And the reason we believe there's such a range here is because, in fact, even though this is one of the streams we actually have some data on, we don't have enough. If we had more data, these limits would come down and you'd have more assurance that if I say that's a plenty of water that's going to be there, then it's more likely that that's a point of water that will be there. But my point in showing the slide here, oftentimes you'll see information presented, you'll get that number. And you won't get the cautionary notes. So let's just take a look. What does that mean? Well, if the fisheries folks say they need 10% of mean annual discharge, these are the critical dates we were looking at. Agriculture was going to be fairly comfortable that they could get two crops, not threat the third if we could use an August 8th cutoff date. So I'm just going to look at, if you look at, well, first of all, all of these represent a surplus. So in fact, when you look at this graph, even with that uncertainty we had, it looked like there wasn't going to be an issue, in fact, or we had a surplus, we could issue more off-stream licensing. That's at 10%. Now, if we change that to at the most, let's talk about just the 20% at the most, that's what this is here. Here's the most here. All of a sudden, remember that? picture we had before, the surplus, now we've got an extreme deficit. And uh, essentially, one of the, for me personally, one of the frustrations we've had, we, we were working very closely with agriculture, with the fisheries folks, there was all, lots of meetings. We actually thought we were going to get an agreement here. When it went up the system and, and it was in DFO, there was no way they were prepared to take no risk whatsoever, and so we had to go with the August one. So even though been, my point in this story is there have been tremendous investment by all parties trying to come up with <coughs> each party accepting some risk at the end of the day, in spite of all that, it didn't fly. And I, and I use this one to illustrate, this is this 80% probability hydrograph. So for the month of August, we, we can say, again, with those confidence limits, that this is 80% probability hydrograph. This is what happens when you use a, a in my opinion, somewhat arbitrary. Uh, well, I need 10%. Oh, okay, that's not a problem. No, well, I think I need 20%. Yeah. 
And then I ask the question, if you need 30% here, and the 80% probability is there, what does that mean? Now, how valid is the 30%? If there's an 80% probability, it's going to be actually down here. So I want to give you some insight into when people actually look at this information. Uh, the first two quotes, uh, well, not quotes, but they're statements that were made in the, in the reports. The first one is from the uh, Lemieux one. Habitat suitability index curves could not be used as they were more likely appropriate for larger rivers. So, so a, a system that had been put in place in BC, we couldn't use it. In-stream flow incremental methodology requires intense field data and also <coughs> complex computer modeling. Under the Campania report, uh, no standard accepted method for setting conservation flows in BC. And conservation flows exceeded base flow in dry years, suggesting, I, I got a kick out of the author on this, suggesting that flows may be set unrealistically high. In other words, what he was saying is if we put all the water back in the stream, and fisheries said they need this flow, well, they wouldn't get it. So his way of communicating that was they, they may be set unrealistically. <coughs> of course, my, my thing is, well, they are. If, if nature didn't give them that water, then you, you're going to have to go back and re-examine. And at yesterday's talk, uh, Rick Palmer of, uh, it doesn't matter which company is, uh, Garden of League, I think it is, he was giving a talk on the effects of uh, groundwater extraction on fish and fish habitat. And in his, uh, one of his slides, he said that uh, attempts to connect in-stream flow models, such as tenant and wetted perimeter, to fish populations have failed. And that's where I was talking about the science of demand. And I, okay, thank you. Uh, this is the tool that I was referring to. That what we did here was uh, this is just as one of the, one of the potential uh, sets of streams. This is the hydrograph. We superimposed on that the hatched area is stored water. Uh, this demand, this demand from base flow, this demand from stored water. Essentially, what I want to show here is that. We used to issue storage licenses that basically went through the fall and early winter. Essentially, the red being fish flow requirements, you really shouldn't be taking anything out of the stream. The fish actually need it. We started to issue only storage coming out of fresh up, just in the recognition of that. But if you didn't have storage water, essentially, with this hydrograph, there's a lot of demand you're not going to need. So, and this is very typical of Okanagan uh, watersheds. That it, storage of the water that's allowed the development to occur in this valley and that's why it's very critical that these parties get a better handle on what are their actual needs. But, but we found this a very effective tool, if you will, because there's a, there's a lot that goes behind creating it, but it, it's a very, I think most people can understand very clearly what it's telling them. Okay, I'm just going to touch on, on my plan stuff. This is my present player. I have to make sure I cover some of this. All in one minute, right? One. <laughs> That's all in one minute. That's right. You never know who's in the audience. Yeah. Uh, but there was a higher level plan created for the Okanagan Shushwap. Uh, the Okanagan Shushwap higher level plan, or the LRP, uh, covers 2.5 million hectares and it's home to over 350,000 people. And essentially, it set uh, objectives for. Uh, different resource values, one of which is water. But you can see it's a very, very extensive area. And just uh, quickly, these were the four objectives that are set in that plan. This is a little bit of that vision stuff that you're talking about, Oliver. I mean, this is it. And again, from my talk, you can see